viewers and listeners, I welcome you all with the Islamic greeting of Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Almighty Allah be upon all of you. My name is Muhammad Awais and this interview is being brought to you by MEND, Muslim Engagement and Development. MEND is a grassroots community-based organization that seeks to tackle Islamophobia in all of its forms, shapes and sizes. Now the problem isn't la cité, secularism. I'll be humble enough not to claim to be an expert, but in a few words to share things as I see them. Islam is a religion that is currently experiencing a crisis all over the world. Now before you shoot me, these are not my words, but the words of the French President Emmanuel Macron on the 2nd of October 2020 at Les Mureaux in the northwest suburbs of Paris. His words are representative of a growing number of individuals advocating some sort of Islamic reform. 30 years ago, Macron says, the situation was radically different. In a way, the religion of Islam was applied, the way it was lived, and the tensions we're experiencing in our society. So here to discuss this perceived clash in ideologies, its deep roots in Orientalism and Islamophobia, and the future of Muslims in Britain, is Dr. Shabir Akhtar. Dr. Shabir Akhtar is a philosopher who was trained at Cambridge University. He has published widely on pluralism, political Islam, Islamophobia. Dr. Akhtar is also a scholar of comparative religion. And in, since 2012, Dr. Akhtar has been on the Faculty of Theology of, and Religions at the University of Oxford. Dr. Akhtar, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalam Wa Rahmatullah. A Cambridge trained philosopher who is also part of the University of Oxford, um, a Faculty of Theology. Uh, surely there aren't many individuals with that sort of CV. Well, it's very kind of you to say that, uh, uh, Oves. Um, I do actually feel that, you know, being in Oxford, for example, is a privilege. And um, I'm not sure about other people's backgrounds, but I'm there on merit because I come from a working class background and I did philosophy at Cambridge, which was unusual because the usual route for people of working class immigrant parents is for such people to uh, do medicine and law and other professions where it's easier to earn a living. So it's been difficult, of course, but I'm very happy because that's my passion. Mashallah. Now, around the same time that Macron uh, made his uh, speech on liberty, uh, you released your second v edition of the best academic r rebuttal I feel to Salman Rushdie's satanic verses, especially in the last 30 years. What was your main motive uh, behind releasing the second edition of uh, Be Careful with Muhammad? Well, the main reason was that uh, firstly I thought the issues with which that book dealt with about the principle of freedom of speech was still relevant. Um, a lot has happened, some of it uh, good, I must admit, salutary, and, but a great deal of it negative. A lot's happened in the last 30 years. So um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to reiterate was firstly my commitment to the defense of the Prophet's honor and to defend uh, Islam against uh, slander so I wanted to reaffirm my position 30 years on. Um, so that was the motive for it. The relevance of the book, I think, needs no argument. As you mentioned, uh, Macron's statement about uh, the uh, severe clash between secularism and the religion of Islam on European soil. So I thought it was a good time, plus the um, events of the Charlie Hebdo um, cartoons and the subsequent killings, I thought this was the right time to intervene in the debate so that a strong voice in defense of Islam could be uh, uh, accessed by people through you know, a book like this. And, and I guess we'll go through how, in my opinion, this book is more relevant today than it was uh, in 1989. Um, now, uh, it's available in the hardback version um, as well as the uh, paperback version. Uh, the interesting thing is the title of your book, which is Be Careful with Muhammad. Now that can sound quite provocative uh, to a non-Muslim audience. So I guess I just wanted to understand a little bit more about um, the title of your book. Well, the French title, Ne touche pas Muhammad, will certainly offend Macron. Uh, the actual title, Be Careful Muhammad, Hoshiar Muhammad, is a Farsi proverb. I've just quoted the last part of it. It is the full uh, 
title of the aphorism or proverb is um, do take liberties with God be free to say what you want about God but Hoshiar Muhammad but be careful Muhammad it was actually a, a, a maxim of caution that Christians missionaries particularly took to heart when they heard this because what the uh, Farsi speaking person who invented this proverb was saying is that God in some sense is in common to the three monotheisms so you know we may have legitimate dif differences of opinion about the character and actions of God you know for the Judeo-Christian tradition and Islam maybe it's the same being but we dispute his character and his actions or maybe it is a different character but say what you like about God means legitimate dispute doctrinally is acceptable but be careful with Muhammad is a warning against abuse of the Prophet which is of course our topic today in other words Muhammad وسلم, is our man the Muslims are he's our man because remember Islam is very generous in his tribute to other prophets Musa salam, Isa Islam, Moses and Jesus, but no such curse is returned by Jews and Christians. They do not think of the Prophet, even as a uh, Prophet of Islam, as being genuine Prophet, let alone the greatest or final one. In fact, they often have reductionist categories. He was just a businessman, he was a man who had many wives, he was a warlord, etc. So the point of caution, be careful Muhammad, although it sounds provocative and aggressive, I agree, is a way of saying that, look, please don't dishonor him. Culturally, you have no regard for him. You do have a regard for Jesus and Moses because it's a Judeo-Christian culture. You have no cultural regard and respect for our prophet. But we do hold him in very high esteem uh, to the point that, as you know, good believers uh, in obedience to the Quran regard the prophet as being more dear to them, to themselves than, them, than their own selves. It's a Quranic imperative, actually, that we are expected to put him first. So that is the background of it. And, and, and we'll discuss a bit more around uh, why Muslims feel the way they do um, about the Prophet um, Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, and, and this cultural, uh, this cultural uh, conflict. Um, however, the second edition comes with um, uh, a new preface. Um, would you be able to just tell us around um, exactly what new editions that you have in your second edition of your book? Well, the, uh, the preface is very substantial, about 50. 40 odd pages. It actually charts the journey of the last 30 years, what I have called the 30 years war. Uh, meaning what's happened. And incidentally, just to introduce that topic, I think Macron is right that 30 years ago the debate was in a different ethos. A lot has happened since then, including of course 9-11, uh, the uh, the Holocaust of Muslims in Bosnia in the early 90s. Um, I discuss all those topics, big things, the Danish cartoons, the whole decade of cartoons, culminating the Charlie Hebdo cartoons in France. I discuss all that. I discuss my role, uh, the reason being that I continue to debate people in various universities and other groups, often of very hostile audiences. I didn't always win every debate, as I say in my preface, um, but I wanted to reaffirm my commitment to the Prophet's honor as a continuing debate. Maybe the issues, as you say, are very more relevant today than ever before, because so much blood, bloodshed has happened in the world. Sadly, mainly of Muslims have been killed and so on. Um, so for that reason, I thought it was an opportune moment for me to reissue this book and to update it. So there's a large sort of philosophical discussion about the nature of free speech. I'm sure we'll discuss that later. Uh, what is this principle? Why there are limits on it? Should there be limits on it? Is it being abused? So all of that I, I do it in an up-to-date way uh, to tell people about why these issues are important. Also I wanted to address some grievances from within the Muslim community which are to the effect that maybe the rise in Islamophobia is due to our decision 30 years ago to take on such powerful enemies again as Rushdi and others uh, and that we shouldn't have done that maybe we ourselves are responsible for the Islamophobia of course I dispute that because I think Islamophobia long predates 1989 and will sadly be here with us during our lifetime absolutely um, 
you, you touched on this. Um, I'd, I'd like you to elaborate on it further. Uh, Macron seems to paint a picture that the last 30 years has seen a rise in what he terms as radical Islam. Uh, and that seems to be the greater problem rather than you know, what he terms as la cité or secularism. However, of course, there was a famous man that remarked, and, and he got, he got um, hounded in the media for this. He said that the next time there are gas chambers in Europe, there is no doubt concerning who will be inside them. Quite a remark. Can you remember who made that? Well, of course, I, I made that remark. I published it in The Guardian at the time of the fatwa in 1989, February. Um, and it was a remark that was widely ridiculed by liberals. Um, however, a mere uh, sort of, say, two, three years after that, the Bosnian war happened where Muslims were actually put into concentration camps. Women were raped, rape being a weapon of war. and so. A number of people felt that that remark of mine was prescient, I won't say prophetic, because that of course in Islam we don't allow people to use that word, prophetic, but it's prescient. It showed a, a sense of the future and a sense of fear and menace. So I was justified in making that comment. And more so today than ever, especially with what's happened with the Rohingya Muslims, as well as what we see with the Uyghurs and whatever is happening also in Kashmir, as well as um, everywhere else around the world. Um, uh, so, so I guess uh, the, the, there is a greater reason for why your your work is so important today than perhaps it was then. Um, so going into it, um, I guess there is something that you, you yourself and Macron have in common, and that is the fact that you've been both been talking about the this divide between uh, secularism and Islam. Do you regard it as a conflict? Do you feel that there is a sort of cold war between the two? Um, uh, how, how do you actually view it? Uh, a few years ago. Uh, Dr. Tariq Amadan and myself took on Douglas Murray in a debate at the Cambridge Union, which I'm pleased to say by God's grace that we won. Many due to both Tariq's amazing eloquence, but I was you know, a partner with him. And the debate was, is Islam compatible with Western liberal democracy, meaning can we live at peace? And we both was in fact emphatically argued that it is possible. Um, in the sense that we Muslims can live as good citizens of the United Kingdom, where there's a large measure of freedom. Of course, there are aspects of political Islam which cannot be implemented here, including the Sharia. Some aspects which cannot be implemented here. But my view is that uh, while as Muslims we should not be aggressive and we should not disobey the law, I see no reason why Muslims, especially in Muslim-majority countries, cannot have um, a constitution that respects the Quran and the Sharia. If this is the majority opinion, there are mostly Muslims there, why shouldn't they have the right to govern themselves according to their own uh, sense of who they are, namely as Muslims? So, I, of course, we are no longer empires based upon religion, Christendom or Islam or Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire being the last religious empire in human history. We are a sovereign nation state, we can respect that. Um, and so, therefore, people can't simply declare uh, jihad, let's say, any more than British and, uh, 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 and French imperialists can go to any country in the world and just annex it to the ground. Those days are past. We do respect international law. Well, at least we ought to. I mean, I don't think the Western nations always, um, some Western nations do not always respect that law. So I think that I would I agree with Macron that um, a lot has changed in the last 30 years. For example, directly with regard to my book, um, one of the things that people notice who read the current edition is that the tone of my book is very liberal and genteel and gentle. There's a lot of philosophical reasoning in the text of the work against Rushdie. I give him his due. You know, I admire him as a writer, but I also take exception on certain points. And same I do with other establishment liberals, such as Michael Ignatieff, who interviewed me in great depth, both in London studios and The Late Show, and actually came to Bradford, which I respect him for, on my ground, to interview me again about the same issues. I think the genteel tone of my work, which I regard as a truly liberal work, meaning it's trying to persuade fellow citizens in a British mature democracy, this is a mature democracy, no doubt, that look, you know, we have a case, this degree of provocation is unwise, you know, with fellow citizens who are Muslim. Uh, so I think that has altered in the last 30 years. Now I think the political debate is much more shrill. We have a lot of sensationalist and polemical atheists, like the late Christopher Hitchens, um, Sam Harris, 
uh, Dawkins, you know, my colleague, not my colleague directly, but you know, Oxford University, uh, who are much more uh, low level of polemics. It's, there's no real depth in it. Dismissive of Islam. Islam is the origin of terrorism. You know, the, the level of debate has gone down and it's less genteel. I remember when my book was first published, and by the way, it was a result of a campaign and it was published contemporaneously with the affair, meaning it was published in 1989, during the actual year of the Rushdie affair, literally one year after Salman Rushdie's book came out. I remember at that time the best review I received, and there were many reviews, some negative, some positive, was from Andrew Brown of The Independent, a very respected journalist and a friend of mine, and he said, uh, I quote, that uh, this book is the best defense of Islam against Salman Rushdie and all his supporters in the English language. That's a lot of praise. And I think the reason was that he felt that I had been truly liberal in my attitude towards my enemies. The book was actually dedicated in the first edition to those on the other side in the hope that they shall understand our pain. I'm a philosopher, I believe in reason, and so I wanted to use reason and not sensationalism to argue my case. And I do believe there was a measure of success in that. Absolutely. In in fact, um, it's a book uh, that, as far as I understood, also in Parliament, I think um, that was being um, used as a study text uh, to understand these issues. That's correct. It's being used. It's recorded in Hansard, the you know the, yeah. the Commons. It, that's actually courtesy of the Bishop of Manchester, at the then Bishop. He met me and uh, read my book with me and said, "I'm going to have it as required reading in both houses of Parliament." That was a you know big moment for me. Fantastic. <coughs> um, Chef, and, and we talk about some of these uh, um, some of these new atheists, like for example Sam Harris um, uh, and and others. And I guess one of the things they have in common is um, the lack of moral argument when it comes to um, uh, attacking Islam. Uh, and the question I would like to ask is. When you look at the forefathers of secularism, when you look at those John Locke um, and thereafter, and also John Stuart Mills, they always had a caveat. In the case of John Stuart Mill, of course, the harm principle. The fact that uh, there shouldn't be an unrestricted level of uh, freedom of expression or freedom of speech. Um, and, and secularism, uh, and I guess the forefathers of secularism had always had that as a caveat. Um, it seems that we're actually going away from the original values uh, which are actually um, quite noble um, into a society that actually the forefathers of secularism would look at today and not recognize. Um, am I justified in saying that? Well, you, you are justified in saying that in general. It has to be said, however, that uh, uh, someone like, say, John Locke, an Oxford philosopher, um, these people, their concern was to do with toleration of interdenominational differences in sectarian Christianity and they were particularly concerned about intolerance among Christian groups. They were trying to curb enthusiasm so it was a different age. John Stuart Mill's case I'll come to in a minute. Um, for example, Locke famously in his letter concerning toleration does not extend toleration to atheists on the ground that people who deny all religious conviction cannot be trusted in contracts and in making promises. But yes, that's true, that the principles of secularism were benign. They were about tolerance of religious differences. And of course, America epitomizes that in the church-state separation, Madison, you know, the, the idea that you can have any faith or no faith. Um, John Stuart Mill, again, a great apostle of liberty, um, would have been shocked because, of course, uh, none of these people envisioned that the principle of freedom of speech, a good principle, would be abused. And that's indeed our Muslim call with it too. I mean, we already have limitations on freedom of speech. It's not unbridled. There are things you cannot say, which I'm sure you'll discuss later, what those limitations are in a secular liberal democracy. Um, my argument in the book was that there should be parliamentary debate to find out new limits of toleration to accommodate Muslim needs. Whether that's to an extension of the blasphemy law, sadly that didn't happen, they abolished the law completely, uh, or whether through an amendment to the Public Disorder Act, any, anything is fine as long as some of these uh, sensibilities um, are protected. I think John Stuart Mill uh, of course, a later figure uh, than Locke. I think, again, there will be a lot of concern that um, freedom of speech is really a blanket, especially in the case of Charlie Hebdo, to abuse people 
to insult people often whose dignity and only source of dignity uh, can be their faith. You know, Pakistanis, Muslims in England and Europe may be marginalized in other ways, bad housing, a lot of unemployment, uh, poverty, yet they have this one precious thing, their faith, which sustains them morally as well as uh, giving them a metaphysics, a big outlook about the nature of life and death. Uh, so I think to attack people on that point, I think it's deplorable and despicable. Indeed, I regard it as a misuse of art. I do not believe in art for art's sake. I do not believe in the maxim that uh, artists have absolute prerogatives to abuse people and to hurt their feelings. So that was the basic background. But yes, you're absolutely right. The evolution of liber liberty to the stage of libertarianism as an ideology, particularly in the US, I think it's hyperbolic, it's excessive, and it has its own kind of fanaticism. There's a chapter in my book called The Liberal Inquisition. Well, of course, the Inquisition was Catholic, but I think the liberals are, not all liberals to be fair, there are some very fair-minded liberals, and that's to whom I address the book. But there are liberals who, who claim to be liberals, like establishment liberals like Hitchens, who I don't think are true liberals at heart. So I think they've betrayed the philosophical tradition of uh, uh, you know, Mill and Locke and others, which is very dear to my heart, because although I'm from Pakistan, uh, I came here as a child. This is also my... Dr. Shreer, many countries have uh, hate speech laws that prohibit certain actions, um, uh, such as, for example, Holocaust denial, and rightly so. Um, however, the same doesn't seem to apply to Islamophobia um, or insults um, against the Prophet Sallallahu um, Why do you think there are such double standards? Well, because... Uh, Culturally, as opposed to legally, there's no cultural capital of respect for the Prophet Muhammad. He's easily the most maligned uh, founder of a faith. A lot of criticism of his character, character assassinations are carried out routinely. Why is this the case? There's a double standard. Well, of course, to be fair uh, to, to Jews, um, I remember saying this to a rabbi once, and he said to me, well, Dr. Akhtar, we did uh, have a holocaust involving six million people. Perhaps after they've murdered six million of your people, people, after, in the aftermath of that there will be some law protecting you. I mean the truth is, you know, societies take time to evolve. I don't think it's a closed issue. It could be the case that over the next few decades there will be increased respect for the Prophet, culturally speaking, meaning informally as a precursor to formal law. Then it may be, it may not happen, I'm not so optimistic, but I'm saying the societies do evolve and so, I mean, look at Irish people, Irish Catholics, they were um, suffering a great deal of victimization and prejudice when they came. Okay, so why should it be any different from Muslims? But the difference is, the big difference is that Islam as a religion and as a civilization, um, before Muslims were colonized by Europeans. Islam was also a colonizer of the West. You know, the Ottoman Empire stretched into large parts of Europe. So we can't ignore the fact that our history is a competitive colonial history with Christianity and with Christendom. So that is what makes it much more charged and there's a greater desire to malign the Prophet. Um, at this stage, because we're living as a peaceful um, religious minority, and we're largely given our rights, especially in a country like England, less true in France, um, I feel that uh, it's quite possible if we find allies with Christians, Jews, and, and uh, good secularist humanists who are willing to look at uh, our faith sympathetically, and with Hindus and people of other faiths, that we might have a more comprehensive law, not a blasphemy law, which is hard to formulate, because the blasphemy law actually only protected Anglicans sensibilities of the Anglican branch of the Christian faith, but maybe um, a public disorder act or a religious discrimination act mm -hmm. that could save us uh, from uh, gratuitous abuse. Of course, many would argue that such a thing is already in place, um, such as the Racial and Religious Hatred Act of 2006. However, um, when it comes to Islamophobia, because Islam is a religion rather than a race, um, therefore uh, there are very few prosecutions that are carried out on, on that part. Um, uh, some examples, for example, Eric Kitson, uh, who was a counsellor, um, actually uh, put a post up on social media uh, showing a Muslim being spit-roasted. Uh, and the fuel that was burning that Muslim was the Qur'an and it, the caption underneath was saying um, hang them all first and ask questions later. 
no action was taken. And that is because there was no intent to stir up uh, racial religious hatred, according to the judge. So it seems that these laws, unfortunately, are quite redundant when it comes to even insults to that level, uh, which are clearly, clearly um, uh, affecting the mental health of uh, societies. Yet, for it, there doesn't seem to be any sort of action taken. Well, t two comments on that. Firstly, uh, the um, religions such as Sikhism and Judaism are lucky in that they're both religions as well as ethnicities, meaning Jews are a race as well as a religion. So they get the best of both worlds in terms of possible uh, appeals for protection. Islam is indeed not a race, it is a you know, potentially universal faith. So there is that difference uh, in its origins, meaning the amalgam of ethnicity and religion is admittedly true. However, the majority of people of the Islamic faith in a country like Britain would be uh, of an ethnic background, like myself from Pakistan. Um, with regard to the question of um, proving uh, the intent to uh, uh, towards religious uh, um, discrimination. That's very difficult in law, partly because um, I worked as a race relations officer at the time I published my book against Rushdie and of course I had to resign because Rushdie is the darling of the liberal press. Um, we were actually, I was trained in Liverpool University in race relations and one of the principles we learned was that there is an important difference between, uh, between um, uh, simple prejudice which can be inside people's hearts, and actual racism. Racism is prejudice plus power, the power to implement your racism. If I'm a factory owner, and I'm Muslim, and I don't like white people, then my prejudice will then turn into racism, and it's illegal in this country. I may not want to employ a white person, you know, because I, I might make some prejudice stereotypical remarks and use my power as a factory owner to you know, deny this person a livelihood, right? The difficulty with the law at the moment is that the threshold for proving the intent regarding religious discrimination is much higher than the threshold for proving there's simply racial discrimination. Lots of people go to industrial tribunals uh, and take the government uh, or any, you know, employer, private work to task. So often they win. The, I was a victim of a, a racist uh, uh, dismissal, etc. Much harder to say for a Muslim woman, look, it's because of my hijab or Muslim man because of my beard, or I was caught doing my ablutions uh, in, a, in a washroom uh, during lunch and the boss doesn't like Muslims, so they fired me, they made up a narrative. The threshold for proving religious discrimination needs to be lowered in Parliament, and for that you need a parliamentary debate. So what we would need is people of the quality of Nas Shah from Bradford West, a brilliant Muslim, you know, who has spoken in honor of the Prophet. Um, Baroness Warsi, no longer Baroness, but she resigned partly because she sensed a degree of uh, prejudice and racism, again from Yorkshire, my, my part of the world. So we need people of that calibre uh, who are willing to say... Seems the best ones come from Yorkshire. <laughs> yeah, I, well, that's in fact true, factually, is <laughs> Empirically, I gave you empirical evidence, not a priori rationalist evidence. That's As a really philosopher, good. I should perhaps appeal to some, you know, <laughs> principles of reason. So yeah, I, I think we will need people back that caliber. I mean, I, I, I'm a philosopher, I'm an activist too. You know, I, I campaign against Rushdie. But, you know, at this stage, I feel that our younger generation needs to get a lot more involved with the parliamentary system and to use this system to influence change yeah. and to seek allies, by the way. I mean, for example, you know, Jews make great allies because often they will understand our pain about what happened in Bosnia, you know, a kind of Holocaust. Or they may, I mean, my own experience in race relations very briefly was that um, for the first time I met Jewish colleagues, often quite secular and liberal rather than devoutly Jewish, who were at the very forefront of battles for racial justice, which pleased me. And they said, well, you know, we're here to help immigrants to fight these, this, this level of discrimination, and many in the church, to be fair, also. So we do have allies, question how to find them and how to reach out to them, rather than to alienate them with comments such as, we are uniquely special. Because remember, as Muslims, we 
asking for a reduction in double standards in the application of the principle of freedom of speech. We're not saying the principle is wrong, we're saying its actual applications are biased. And of course, that's a Quranic way. Let us come to common terms, isn't it? Um, Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, and also not only that, I mean, the Quran also says elsewhere that uh, for people with dogmatic and doctrinal differences, which are a deadlock in this world, vie with each other, compete with each other in the performance of good actions. So ethical consensus is a great idea with people of faith where we, you know, in, in good faith, in good conscience, they cannot compromise on their principles of dogma, like Christians cannot, certain views about ecclesial claims about the nature of Jesus Christ. Islam rejects them, but we can still work together as, uh, firstly, as you know, fellow human beings, common humanity, and secondly, because Muslims recognize that Jews and Christians and others also are trying to walk in the path of grace, of the God, of the true God. So we can look for allies. Absolutely. Um, I, I, and that brings us back to the point of, about the society. As much as we want to bring about a uh, change in law, which is vitally important, you talked about society needing to evolve. Now, I'm going to be a bit of a, um, a sports sport, and I'm going to say that um, according to uh, an author, Miranda Fricker, there is something called um, uh, what, what we call um, hermeneutical mar marginalization, where the structural framework of a society is sort of the default position tends to be Islamophobic. And therefore, the marginalized people within that community um, don't really have a voice because the default position is Islamophobia. So the marginalized people actually, they're regarded as uh, aliens, really. Um, so how, how would you deal with that sort of society? And, and hopefully we're not at that level, but there are many communities around the world where you could say that the structural framework of a society is deeply and inherently Islamophobic. Um, uh, and therefore, Miranda Fricker refers to these marginalized people as, as uh, hermeneutically marginalized because they've got no way of expressing themselves. Um, uh, is she accurate in what she says? Yes, yeah, she's absolutely right. I mean, in my uh, book, Be Careful Muhammad, the first edition, I reprint the preface to it, which actually was about an illiterate Pakistani woman, a bit like someone like my mother, let's say, going to school and being lectured to by the English literature teacher saying we ad admire great literature like the satanic verses. She didn't know what to say. She was uh, incoherent with indignation, of course, that her children went to the school. My book uh, was actually written partly to uh, make articulate the Muslim who's helpless against such accusation, which is why I think it would be a good thing if the book were widely read by Muslims who can then simply give a copy to a non-Muslim and say, look, here's somebody who's explained and articulated our anger. Um, so yes, of course, I, I agree with her. And by the way, it's, a, it's, a, it's refreshing for me to be interviewed by someone who's not a philosopher professionally, but who uses much longer words than I do, uh, such as I'm anutically marginalized. Um, and yes, absolutely, there, there is a degree of voicelessness, admittedly not to an extreme extent. I mean, I think that one of the great achievements of the Rishti affair uh, was that the veto on Muslim voices in um, academia and media was broken. We had Muslims speaking for the first time, including myself and many other brothers who made even larger contributions than me. Um, so that was, the veto was broken. Now the spokesmanship for Islam was in the hands and mouths of the able Muslims too. So not everyone who came to TV anymore, 30 years on, is a Marxist. Muslim with a Muslim name, but who doesn't believe in it, or a Jewish or a Christian Orientalist expert. We now do have the right to speak our mind. And that is only possible, of course, because Britain does have a, a mature democracy and is willing to listen to dissident voices. And fortunately, the government here is a mature democracy. It doesn't go around gunning people down as soon as they start complaining or demonstrating. We have that right. So I think that you know, there's a great deal of hope that um, this hermeneutical marginalization will decrease as larger numbers of Muslims go into the professions including into my own professional academia. Sadly, there aren't many successful Muslim academics, very few, very few journalists of Muslim background who are still in some measure committed to Islam. I mean, I don't mean that they need to be polemical against other faiths, but they need to be fair-minded to other people, while at the same time, obviously, belonging to their own community. Because if they don't belong and they reach the top, then that's an empty victory.
Dr. Shabir, of course, Islamophobia comes in many guises and many forms. Uh, you've written extensively um, in various books of yours, and you've touched on it in, in, in Be Careful with Muhammad as well. But would you like to elaborate on um, your view around the different forms uh, that Islamophobia comes in? Yes, uh, I. Firstly, I don't think it's necessary to define it absolutely clearly. I think sometimes academics fall into the trap of, uh, particularly sociologists, of wanting a precise definition, which can sometimes be a substitute for actually tackling the problem. You become so involved in debates about words. I think we've got a rough idea what it is. Yes, I do examine it more analytically. Uh, and of course, the main thing is about the levels of it. So for example, if I'm approached by a drunk man on a late night trip, and he says to me, go back home. He may not even know where my home is, right? Uh, and there's no point in engaging him at that crude level of uh, racism and Islamophobia because um, he doesn't understand that there are economic consequences of British imperialism, that I'm here because you guys were there for 350 years. My father has to come to a country to find a job. There's no point engaging at that level, right? Working class racism or that of a drunk man. That's very blatant, and I think we all agree that racism is a social evil. You know, good uh, liberals and white people and legislators all agree on that. So there's no debate about that. However, a middle class person, educated person, may have Islamophobic prejudice and tendencies, um, and there, this comes out in a. a in a more innocuous way perhaps, uh, less harmful, but it is in the long run harmful. So for example, if you're a school teacher with Islamophobic views, this could affect uh, the teaching of Muslim children. You know, If you think these people are all terrorists, uh, or they come from homes where there's no academic ambition, this may affect your views on that. And then there's the um, Islamophobia policy makers, and possibly of people who are aristocrats and upper class, that's much more dangerous. Uh, people who are heads of colleges or people in parliament, house of lords, there I think it's tougher to dislodge those prejudices, but it's important to do so. And I'm not saying it's widespread, I mean there are people of goodwill and conscience even at the highest levels of society. I mean I think for example many people have been touched by Prince Charles' work on trying to you know get more understanding for minorities including Muslims by the way. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying it's a uniform picture but there is racism of different levels so the racism of a of a, of a news editor at the Times or Daily Telegraph or uh, or some, you know, a newspaper that's, let's say, very conservative, is very different from that of somebody who is swearing at you when they're drunk, or even of a white working class man who's lost his job, he feels resentment at migrants, you can address that. But I think that the uh, Islamophobia of someone like, let's say, the editor of The Spectator, Douglas Murray, is going to be much more difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess just touching on that and uh, elaborating further, Obviously, Muslims feel very strongly about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to the extent that he's more beloved to us than our own parents um, and, and anyone in the world. But this is hard for people to understand. Mm. Uh, you mentioned in your book, uh, you say, my message in this book that moral progress in cultures is not achieved through distorting their history and self-image and substituting a caricature, a false and insulting revisionist account of their origins as a faith and civilization. Religions also have communal self-esteem. Their adherence can be wounded. Now what if someone was just to play devil's advocate and say, well, so what? You know. No, well, it's a very important point, a very, very probing question. Um, I think that um, the level of Muslim uh, attachment to the Prophet and to their faith as a very sane, balanced and beautiful religion is very hard to understand for non-Muslims. Indeed, this has been an aspect of my academic work on Christianity. I'm an expert on Christian theology. Uh, the, how do we Muslims appear to uh, non-Muslims, particularly to fellow theists, monotheists like Jews and Christians, whom we regard as errant, partly misguided, and who think we are fully misguided. That's the way they return the compliment. Yes, I think it's difficult to explain that. However, we're not asking as Muslims for non-Muslims to have the same regard for the Prophet that we have. Obviously, that would be an absurd requirement. What we're asking for is 
legal protection against the worst kind of gratuitous abuse. And in particular, what we're saying is that the uh, recourse to the principle of freedom of speech is unfair. It's a noble principle in its content, but its application can be unfair and uh, subject to double standards and be bigoted. Because the fact that something is a principle doesn't mean it's automatically got a good content, morally. I mean, a man like Hitler had integrity, meaning consistent principles, but they were all consistently bad principles. A principle can have a content that is wicked and genocidal. Those people are very principled. The point is to have principles whose content is also morally defensible. And I argued this in some nuance, because I'm a philosopher, I can explain this in some depth. So we are as Muslims are not asking for special uh, concessions, we're asking for equal standards of justice, single standards of justice, some measure of cultural respect. So for example, you know, the, the cinematic melodramas of Hollywood, which portray Muslims as always villains, always terrorists, the only good terrorist is a, is a dead terrorist, the only good Muslim is a dead Muslim. We, we need to tackle those depictions and stereotypes uh, and try to do them at the level at which they are issued. Yeah, some sort of distant part of the Orient, which um, Edward Said encapsulates very well in his book, um, Orientalism in 1979. Um, um, uh, and uh, I guess going on from that, um, this this perception that uh, Muslims are some sort of part of the Orient, uh, not part of the Western society, that don't really understand Western society, and in fact Macron um, kind of um, uh, alluded to that when he said we are training imams and Muslims. We are training imams and Muslims as if, you know, they were the subject race right. and we know what is good for them and we know them better than they could possibly know themselves. Uh, that somehow uh, sounds quite condescending. But of course Islam has a massive contribution to Western society. Um, and and y you're a philosopher but you're a historian as well. Um, and I guess for, for those that perhaps aren't well aware of uh, the Renaissance and other things, would you be able to elaborate a bit more on actually how Western society has been shaped by Islam and Muslims and the Prophet Muhammad? Well, uh, European self-image uh, has been consciously shaped in response to, sometimes it's in hostile opposition to the presence of Islam as a military force on European frontiers, Ottoman Empire, for example, the last religious empire in history. On an intellectual level, Muslims, um, Arab Muslims particularly, were in the early centuries of the Abbasid era, for example, responsible for transmitting to Europe the lost uh, classical heritage of Greek philosophy, for example, uh, so that this lent to the end of the Dark Ages in Europe and to the beginning of a new um, respect for classical learning among Europeans, Christians, what's called the Latin scholastic tradition, and then also the Renaissance, which was a secular movement. But even in my view, in the Reformation, which is a religious movement, I think Islam had a role to play, especially through the presence of the, of the, uh, of the Ottoman Empire on the boundaries of Christianity. So, I mean, if you want to put it in a summary form, I would even go to the extent of saying, as I have in one of my books on Islam and politics, that when Muslims had power in the world, they gave the world scholarship, wisdom, science, uh, as well as a stable political order in the Middle East, which only ended with the end of the Ottoman Caliphate, you know, relative degree of peace and respect in Palestine and respect for people of the book. Um, so Islamic ascendancy was lenient and honorable, right? Sadly, once we became powerless after the colon colonization of the Muslim world, um, what we gave the world, it seems, is um, terrorism. In not proper politics, you know, people going and blowing up buildings because they want to be noticed to kind of create a nuisance. What I'm saying is when Islam was legitimately empowered, it gave the world a peaceful order and the gift of scholarship. So I think Europe has a, a huge debt. The difficulty is that Europeans, unlike other civilizations, are not requ required to um, acknowledge their sources. So for example, you know, even Greek classical civilization may be indebted to Egypt, uh, pagan Egypt obviously, pharaonic Egypt, not Islamic Egypt. But 
European historians don't feel that they need to acknowledge any source outside Europe. So they're very reluctant, for example, in the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, very reluctant to admit that the great Muslim figures such as Averroes, Ibn Rushd, and the other great Muslim philosophers also had a contribution. They all have Latinized names, incidentally, you know, like Averroes, Avicenna. Avicenna yeah. yeah, et cetera. The reason is because Europe benefited from these people. They not only preserved the light of classical um, Greek or Roman learning, they added to it as they transmitted it. Mm, absolutely. Uh, and so uh, this gets us to a good point, um, the future. What does the future look like? Um, so uh, Justin Cesari, University of Birmingham, not too far away from here, says that the matter narrative on Islam is largely based on the idea of a conflict between Islam and the West, portraying Islam as a problem or an ab obstacle to modernization. And it has forced Muslims to examine their own identity. She's not wrong. I mean, the reality is there are many Muslims uh, that seem to be apologizing for who they are. Um, we're not going to mention many names. Uh, let's just leave that out of this conversation. Um, um, but, but it is a problem. And in fact, uh, when we had a private discussion, you told me that was a greater problem. Um, the fact that there are Muslims that seem to be apologizing for, for who they are and uh, questioning their identity. So where is the future of Muslim orthodoxy? Do we need a Martin Luther? Um, well, we don't need um, a reformer in that sense because Islam was, in my view, historically already born as a reformed faith. We don't have a clergy, at least in Sunni Islam. And it was a very enlightened religion, it was very balanced, very respectful of the need for a legal order on earth, a political order on earth which is fair-minded and just, as well as the balance with the Akhira, the idea of an afterlife where we must go. So I don't think we need a Martin Luther. I remember Martin Luther was needed to reform the corruption of the Catholic Church. We don't have a corrupt clergy in that way. Obviously there are individual uh, members of the religious intelligentsia who may not be living up to Islamic standards. But I think that this is a question in which Islam has both strengths and weaknesses. The strength is that, I mean Muslims that is right, the strength is that we have largely, unlike say religions such as um, Christianity and modern forms of secularized Judaism, we have actually managed to um, keep our Islamic heritage intact and to transmit it fairly accurately. I mean like myself as a boy, going to a madrasa or a school uh, in Bradford, learning what Islam is. Later on, of course, once you've got the heritage, you may be in a position to critique it, disagree with it, call for reforms of it, etc. But at least you know what it is. You know about the canonical requirements of the faith. Whether you practice them or not is different, but you know what they are. So I think that's a great achievement of the Ulama, by the way, in European Islam, that we have actually managed to keep our faith intact. Now, Professor Cesari's point is correct, I believe, that we Muslims are perceived to be a problematic community, partly because, let's say, take an area such as education, we've made piecemeal demands on the state that we must be accommodated within the state education system, you know, changes to diet and dress, more distress for girls in school, diet, halal meat, and the, the state, we fear, has conceded this. The question is, what about our duties as good citizens of a country of adopted citizenship? For example, we have to live by the laws of this land, which is why in my book I do not argue for the implementation of the fatwa on Rushdie. You know, if, if there are Islamic nations where he enters, it's their decision, right? We're not in a position to tell them, they can't do that. But it's not our duty as British Muslims living outside a properly judicially constituted Islamic government to take the law into our own hands. So yeah, we are trying to be good citizens. So although we are seen for the, in, the, in the prism of a problematic community. I don't believe we're any more problematic than the Catholics, Irish Catholics, when they first arrived. You know, their churches were burnt down. So we've had a degree of prejudice, but I don't see, I don't think that the future will be negative, necessarily negative. In any case, although the future is contested, it's a shared future. We share it with other citizens of this country and with people of other faiths, including Christians and Jews and, and, and Sikhs and Hindus and so on. So I'm actually quite optimistic about the future. But at the same time, I don't want to suffer from what I have elsewhere in my writings called the Bosnia syndrome, meaning, you know, there's a genocide on your threshold and, and you the, at your door and you are having an ostrich policy of not recognizing it, which is the point of MEND and other organizations to make us aware 
and to make us intellectually aware of what our true standing is in society. Well, one is to not recognize, but I think the greater threat is what you mentioned in, in your book, uh, which is the so-called, uh, and you call them the so-called moderate Muslims. Of course, they're various different types, but but you refer to, you know, you talk about them uh, themselves doing nothing, uh, but actually making time to condemn their brethren who stood up for the honor of the Prophet of Islam. And I think that's a really wor big worry within our society that there are individuals that actually spend their time condemning others within our society. They're not helping the situation at all. And they're not standing up for the honor of the Prophet either. Well, when I've uh, talked to different Muslims in the 30 years since the Rishti fear, many have said to me, oh brother, our community took a wrong turn and I personally blame you partly for it to me. I said, why? They say, well, you stood up for the honor of the Prophet against very powerful enemies. I you shouldn't have done I that. heard about this and in fact, that was from an institution a supposed Islamic institution yeah, that said true. that to you. Indeed it was. And that's really worrying. Well, it is worrying. Of course, the strict libel laws of this country prevent me from naming we individuals, won't mention, yeah. individuals and institutions who I think uh, are compromised in that way. Um, and of course, you know, I respect the contributions of fellow Muslims who may differ from me in their political opinions, as long as they're doing something for the sake of the, the general good of this society and of the good of the Ummah. But the truth is that um, we are in a position where those of us who do make an effort to stand up and do some activism are not only condemned uh, for what we do, but of course also inadequately appreciated for the personal sacrifices that one makes, you know. I mean, you do have to pay a price uh, in one way or another. Admittedly, you know, the price in this country is not as high as some of our Muslim brothers and sisters are paying in places like Palestine or Chechnya or Kashmir, you know, where they actually killed. Uh, we don't have that. We, fortunately, we live in a good country in that way. But I think we do need to, in our own community, respect those Muslims who are standing up and making an effort. Um, and, and, and finally, Dr. Shabir, uh, I think you've made an immense contribution um, over the last 30 years, and I think the Muslim community, as well as uh, you know, uh, the, the academic community, is extremely grateful for for the work that you put in. And I'm, I'm I personally am so appreciative that um, I have the opportunity not only to um, to interview you, but to also call you my teacher and my mentor. So thank you so much. I'm very grateful. Uh, Dr. Shabir's book, Be Careful with Muhammad, is out in its second edition, available also on Amazon. And um, Dr. Shabir, I'm going to leave the final words to you. Uh, to say a little bit more about the book and um, and, and to end this uh, wonderful conversation. Thank you, Vais. Well, uh, the book, um, uh, Be Careful Muhammad, second revised edition, I very consciously made sure I take on Salman Rushdie in a fair-minded way, meaning admiring him for his literary accomplishments while taking total exception to the satanic verses which I condemn uh, as an inferior piece of literature, let alone uh, condemning its inaccuracies as an attempt to mimic and caricature Islamic history, to give an offensive revisionist account of Islamic origins, to say things about the Prophet and his wives which are completely malicious in my view, sensationalist and, and, and obviously they a form of libel if the Prophet were alive, uh, physically alive, of course ideologically he's alive in our hearts, then there would be a possibility of taking him to, to court. The other feature of the book which I hope people will enjoy, and the book is written for everybody, Muslim and non-Muslim, is I've consciously tried to write in a style that is respectable from the point of view of literature, so it's an enjoyable work and also it's an occasion for me to be uh, indulging in the tradition of satire, mocking my enemies and the enemies of Islam, something we don't do in Islam. We need to do that because their weapon is one of satire and mockery and ridicule. So it does mean that perhaps um, if I ever stop being a professional philosopher, I can have another second career as a, a sit-down stand-up comedian. Thank you very much, Dr. Shabir. It's been a pleasure. Assalamu alaikum.